It's Sunday morning, and we're in a study on prophecy. It sounds strange to say we're in a study on prophecy and then say the direction we're speaking on prophecy is tongues. But tongues has to do with prophecy uh, because tongues is the method by which God is going to get the gospel to the Gentile elect or to the Gentiles, which are the spirits in prison. The word prison, phulake, uh, it means the division of day and night, or light and darkness. Light and dark. And of course, when you, you come up with the division of light and dark, you come up with where the sun shines. God uses this, and you come up with the horizon. The horizon is the division of light and dark, isn't it? And God tells the, has Paul write to the uh, Gentile churches, you were darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, light inside the horizon. And he will say uh, that, uh, we're not the children of the darkness, that that day should overtake us as a thief. We're the children of the light. And he's translated us from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, which is the kingdom of light, in Colossians, the first chapter. So when we're talking about this subject, the horizo, a prison, the spirits in prison were those who were in darkness, and God did not give the Gentiles... God did not give the Gentiles the truth. Gentile is everybody that's not a Jew. The Semitic line began with Adam, went down to Noah. Noah's son, Shem. We get the word Shemitic or Shemite or Semitic, which means Jewish. Which means Jewish from the name Shem. And then Shem's great, 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 great grandson was Abraham. His son was Isaac. His son was Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel. And because Israel ends up over in Egypt 400 years, and then Moses comes along, God has Moses lead them out of the wilderness, and uh, they're given, they are given uh, laws, and God says, if you're not obedient to my laws that Moses receives on Sinai, I'll send Four judgments, the sword, the famine, the pestilence. Pestilence is all kinds of disease. The sword is their enemy will come against them and constantly conquer them. And famine is any kind of disease. It's uh, no food. And God would say no rain. Did that in the uh, no rain. That would be during the days of Elijah. And, and uh, he said the last thing I'll send is the beast. The beast, of course, is Babylon. Persia overthrows Babylon. Babylon's overthrown by Greece, the Alexandrian Empire, Alexander the Great. And then Rome would subjugate the four generals that Alexander leaves to take over his empire. And they would be carried into captivity. Of course, Israel comes back to the land that was given Abraham after being over here 400 years. And, they're, and they are under judges, some say, some say 250, some say up to 350 years. It just depends on when the judges started. And then they become a kingdom under kings, and God, well, they're not split yet. They start as one kingdom, one kingdom under Saul, uh, David, and Solomon. And because of Solomon's apostasy, God splits the nation and they're, go, and they're split into two kingdoms, southern Judah, that's comprised of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, uh, naming it after the tribe of Judah. That's southern Israel. Northern Israel is the ten northern tribes, or we would call them the ten lost tribes. And the ten northern tribes, that was northern Israel, headed up by Joseph uh, and through his second-born son, Ephraim. Ephraim. He receives the inheritance of all of all it. Well, God scatters northern Israel in 722 B.C. because they go after these idol gods, they go after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech and all the gods of the nations around them, including the gods of Egypt, 
I sees an Osiris and so forth. After God leads him out of Egypt, he says, and you do this to me? So he scatters northern Israel, he scatters southern Judah, and when they're, when they're in southern Judah, southern Judah or southern Israel is scattered. They're scattered by Babylon, then Babylon is overthrown by Persia, Persia is overthrown by Greece under Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great gives all the world its, its languages. It gives all the world its dialects, and they had an international language of Greek, and they had a different dialect of the Greek all, uh, all over the world in every city that ruled to a state line or a city-state and these dialects would differ as much as two foreign languages. And just because you could speak one dialect of the Greek didn't mean you'd understand the other. And they also had glossa, which means foreign language. Now, that's just a quick summary. So whenever you get into the tongues, it has to do with the fact that Israel is scattered. Israel is going to be brought back one day, and they're already back as of May 14th, 1948. So if you'll notice... The tongues goes with the prophecy, and of course, the prophecy goes with Christmas. Christmas, because the same gods that Israel went after, going after Baal in the grove and Shemash and Molech, that's the same gods under another name that Constantine brought in the church in 325 A.D. and renamed the Christ Mass. Christ Mass. And we call that Christmas. And, and, and uh, they brought in this sun god, and all the sun god's birthday was December the 25th. Not going to go into that right now. I've gone into it a hundred times. Now, we see that tongues has to do with the fact that Israel was scattered and that Christmas has to do with why God scattered them because they went after all these gods all the time they were a nation which was the fire and tree worship. That's what the Christmas lights are at Christmas time, and that's what the trees are. That's the tree goddesses. So what we're talking about <clears throat> is tongues of prophecy. It is dialects and glossa. Now, I've, I've covered some territory, and you'll forgive me if I, some of you that have been here, if I review some things because there's people seeing this for the first time, and they're not going to have any idea what's going on. Now, when I teach on something, I reset every week what I'm talking about because if people heard this for the first time, they're not going to be able to understand it. I've spent 58 years studying and looking at tongues. Uh, I'll be 74 next week. And the reason I preach on tongues so much it's because I traveled in all those Pentecostal churches. Even the Baptists won't say they don't believe in tongues. They'll simply say, well, those Pentecostals are our brothers and sisters, and we need to let them worship God the way they want to. They won't stand up and say, we don't believe in tongues. First of all, I've never heard anybody. I've, got, had, I've bought all kinds of books on tongues all my life, and I've found out that nobody really understands the full story. Don't just call me and say, I know that tongues are foreign languages. I've had people say that. I say, but you need to know the whole story. The whole story is that tongues are going to be used, the tongues are going to be used, the dialects in glossa, a dialect of the koine, K-O-I-N-E, is the Greek word common. We actually get the word K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, which is the word fellowship. Fellowship or to or communion. Communion or partaker or it means to have in common. Well, this word koine, it's the Greek word for common. It's a co there's a common street language in every city, and those are dialects. That's why the people said in Acts, the second chapter, 
let me kind of review it a little bit. The Jews were given Exodus, the 23rd chapter. If I say this enough, maybe you'll wake up in your sleep saying it. And that, that's maybe what you need. In Exodus, the 23rd chapter, and in other chapters, but this is the one I pick out. I like the way it says it. That the, all the males in Israel, this is the law. This is what Moses is getting when he goes to Sinai. He's on Sinai talking to the Lord after he leads the children into the desert when he gets this message. He gets to Sinai in Exodus the 19th chapter. He gets the Ten Commandments in the 20th chapter. He's getting other laws when he's on Sinai. And all the males had to come back to Jerusalem. Every, every major festival, particularly three festivals, three festivals, they had to come back to Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering. That's another name for the Feast of Tabernacles, Tabernacles or the Feast of Huts. Feast of Huts. And that same month, which is the seventh month, on the tenth day of that seventh month was the Day of Atonement. So all these Jews have to come back from all over the world. And remember, they've been scattered by Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, then Rome. This is the beast there in Daniel 7 and, and Revelation 13. Well, they've been scattered all over the world, and they're speaking all these dialects and these glossa that Alexander the Great has given them. And all of the world is speaking Greek, and most of the Jews are not speaking Hebrew anymore. The Lord inspired the New Testament to be written in the Hebrew. And by, by 200 A.D., Alexander the Great has had such an influence. He lived from around 332 to 320, only about 12 years as commander of the world, and yet he conquered all the world and gave all the world all of its, its glossa and all of its dialects. And, and there became so many people speaking Greek that by 200 B.C., he's living 332 to 320 B.C., before Christ. By 200, there were so many Greek-speaking people in the world under Alexander the Great, the Jews found it necessary to translate the Hebrew text into, into Greek, into Greek. That is the Old Testament, and we have that today. I've got a copy, and some of you have got a copy. That's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, and this Septuagint, when you see LXX, that's 70 Roman numerals, that took 70 translators to translate the Septuagint, and they called that the, uh, that's the translation because... By 200, Alexander the Great, while he was the emperor, had given all the world all of these dialects and glossa. And Hebrew had been, uh, I, I call it a, uh, they kind of deified the Hebrew language, the rabbis did, so that, uh, so that most Hebrews did not speak, only, speak Hebrew. Only, only the rabbis and the scholars that were studying the law most people in northern Israel did not know Hebrew. Uh, they were considered a bunch of uh, outcasts and cast-offs by the Pharisees. So all the world is speaking these gloss and these dialects. That's why they said all these males, Acts 2, I'm talking about Acts 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. Acts 2, we've covered most of that. We've covered... We covered about half of Acts 2, and we covered about a little over half of 1 Corinthians 14. I want you to understand what the tongues is about. It is absolutely nothing to do with Pentecostalism. When I say Pentecostalism, I'm talking about this form of denomination that's out here. A Pentecostalism is any church that believes in speaking in that jabbering language that they do, all it is doing is opening your mouth and making up words like a little kid who's uh, trying to learn to speak at four years old or three and a half. And they're just... 
You say, that sounds silly. That's what it is. It's silly. It's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with what God is saying here. They said in Acts 2, how here we every man, and these are Jews from every nation under heaven because they had to come back, and they said, how here we? How here? He said, they said, we are hearing in our own tongue. The only problem is that word tongue is dialectos. How are we hearing with our ears in our own dialect of the Greek, koine, wherein we were born? The people from Athens were hearing in their Athenian dialect. The people from Ephesus were hearing in their Ephesian dialect of the Greek. The people from down here in Babylon or Mesopotamia were hearing in their dialect. The people up here in Assyria were hearing in their dialect, the Ethiopian theirs, Egypt and theirs. That's what they were hearing in. And they all spoke with other heteroglossa, other foreign languages. That's what it says, not that jibber-jabber. As the Spirit gave them utterance, and the Bible says that there were in fact, if you look back over there, it says that uh, in Acts 2, let's go back over there, that it speaks and says they were all, uh, that cloven tongues like as a fire set up on each of them. Let me say this again. Cloven is the word diamerizo. Diamerizo means petitioned off. It would only be cloven in the sense, it's not this, not this, like they, like they draw a picture of a flame and it's over that man's head. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about petitioned off tongues, the Ethiopian here, the Athenian here, the Egyptian here is hearing in his dialect. Now, I don't know exactly how God had those men do it. He had had them speak in heteroglossus. So whenever we get on down further into the chapter, Peter is speaking in other foreign languages. I don't know what languages he was speaking in, but they were hearing in their dialect. Now, why was the necessity? The necessity of the tongues, the reason they had to have them. This is an absolute necessity because all these Jews coming from all over the world to Israel they had been scattered for 500 years by the time you get the, to the Pentecost of Acts 2. All these Jews, as they're coming over here, they didn't understand each other when they got there to Pentecost. And they're, when they get there, they're all understanding a different language. When they get there, they're petitioning these tongues off, and Paul is speaking, and they're hearing in their dialect in the nation where they were born. This has nothing to do, like I say, with that Pentecostalism. Let me, and then he says, and they're petitioned off these languages. The reason for this is because Paul, uh, Jesus called 12 disciples to follow him, or 12 apostles. Only Judas was from southern Judah. He hangs himself. Jesus comes to the eleven and says, Go into all the world and teach all nations. That was an astounding statement. How can eleven ignorant, more or less ignorant, northern Galilean fishermen and farmers go into a world with all these educated gloss and dialects? How are they going to do that unless God gives them a miracle? of the glossa and dialectos. If God doesn't let them, God gives them this ability to go and speak the gospel to the world. That's what the tongues were for. It was to get the gospel to the all flesh or to the Gentiles as opposed to, to the one flesh of this Semitic 
race, started with Adam, goes down to Noah, Shem, down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. His name is changed to Israel. This is the one flesh. This is all the same seed. The seed of Adam, let me put it this way, the sperm of Adam was in Jacob. My great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, whoever he was, and I don't even know who he was, his sperm is in me. His seed is in me. So this was the one flesh, and God says in Acts 2, I have blinded the eyes of the Jews. I'm going to call my people by another name, Gentile elect church, spiritual Israel, Gentile elect church, spiritual Israel. That's what I'm going to call. And that's the all flesh or the all men or the whosoever. Whosoever, people naturally think whosoever, uh, that they think that will goes with that. Therefore, that means free will. Whosoever will may come is not in the Bible anywhere. It's absolutely not there. Now, let me give you something on this word whosoever. This is talking about anytime you find whosoever, that was first mentioned over in Joel when Joel said, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. The Gentiles were forbidden from having the truth over here in the Old Testament. Once in a while, God would call a Gentile right, Rahab the harlot. Rahab are the, are like Ruth, the Moabite, or like Ittai, the, the one of David's commanders, and he was a, he was a Philistine, Philistine, or he would call Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar we'll see in heaven because Nebuchadnezzar uttered those words. He said, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or arrest his hand and stop him from doing what he's doing. God says, I do exactly what I want to do. I save who I will, and I damn who I want to. That's what he, what he says. So this one flesh receives, and God's going to pour out of his spirits on the Gentile church, and the method he's going to use is the dialects and the, and the glossa. And the glossa, this is what God is going to use. The foreign languages and the dialects, because you've got the Jews... We talk about the diaspora or diaspora, D-I-A, S-P-O-R-A. The diaspora, dia, to thoroughly spore. To spore, spore is seed. And God simply used Nebuchadnezzar as a farmer to scatter God's seed all over the earth. So he could be calling the Jews back from all over the world and then have them go out throughout the world when they leave Jerusalem, they're all going back to their lands and they're going to preach to the people of the different lands in their dialects and in their glossa. But as far as the apostles continuing with these dialects and glossa, that's only going to continue until the church matures. And Peter said the church was maturing in the first century. The diaspora is the Jews being scattered all over the earth. That's what they call the diaspora, diaspora. Now, I'm trying to finish up. Let's go back over to 1 Corinthians 14 first. We've gone through, there's two different things happening. If you're watching my tongue series, I've been on this for about going on three months. You've got to watch the entire series. Don't expect me to answer all the questions in one message. I can't do that. There's too much to this. But I hope you can see that tongues and prophecy are directly related. Prophecy is about everything that happened from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. Everything in prophecy. Israel was scattered all over the earth. They're going to be brought back at the end of time, and they are back right now. And the tongues is, is, is a result of this, and the 70 weeks of Daniel is a result of this prophecy and this scattering and this scattering. And Christmas was resulted from it. All of this has to do with the same 
with the same thing. It all has to do with prophecy. Now, now I want us to go back. The tongues is the means by which God is going to pour out of His Spirit, Holy Spirit's truth, Thy Word is truth. The Jews got the truth over here, one flesh. I'm going to keep repeating that. Now God's going to pour out of His Spirit on the Gentile church, and God has an elect family among the Gentiles. I want to give you some things on this word whosoever. Let's go back to... My gosh, I've got so many places to go to. Let's, I'll give you whosoever in a minute, but let's go back to 1 first, first Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And the Gentile, when you think Gentile, anybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile. But we are Jews of the heart. We're circumcised of the heart. We're spiritual Israel. So Gentile church. The Gentile church is God's spiritual Israel. And the means that God's going to get the, the gospel to them which is God's Spirit and the Holy Spirit's truth. And he's going to reach out to the Gentile church or all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. All flesh. Now, let's go back over here to the 14th chapter. We've read through the first part of this. You've got to keep remembering that Corinth was on the here, this is Greece right here. If this is Greece, and here's the Peloponnesus. This is Greece. This is the Peloponnesus down here. That's like a big hand down there. And Corinth is right here on there's a land bridge that connects Upper Greece with Lower Greece. Upper Greece up here, this is the Aegean Sea. Here is Turkey, what we call Turkey. And they call that Asia Minor, Asia Minor. And the seven churches of Asia right in here that John wrote to. Patmos is right out here off the coast of, of Turkey, Patmos. That's where John wrote the book of Revelation. He was on the island of Patmos, and he sent these letters to these people here, and then they sent them out to all the world because they're inspired. Uh, up here in this area right up here is Philippi and Thessalonica. So Paul travels there. Now, Corinth is right here. It's the very seat. <clears throat> it's as though Corinth is the hub of all the world of trade, Merchants of all kinds, and they had all kinds of, all kinds of glossa going on there at Corinth. All kinds of debauchery. They were worshiping Aphrodite and Venus and, and temple worship. And Paul speaks of this in the 8th through the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, they speak all these glossa. What's going on in Acts 2 is not the same thing that's going on here. Paul is talking here. Don't let a bunch of these sailors come in, a bunch of these merchants come in here speaking in gloss and dialects without an interpreter. I don't want that. I don't want somebody coming in here. Let me just say it this way. I don't want anybody coming in here. Some of you that speak Spanish, don't you stand up and start preaching in Spanish because you're going to get my wrath upon you. You're going to get God's wrath because nobody understands but you and the other people who speak Spanish. And Mike speaks German, and very few people speak German. If he gets out here and starts speaking in German and preaching and interrupting, I'm going to say, stop that right now. That's what Paul was saying in this chapter. He's saying everybody has to understand. We, we preach through here. I'll, I'll say a couple of things we've said. He says, the man that speaks in an unknown tongue, in verse 4, edifies himself. Edify means to build up. It's the word oikodomeo. It means to build his own house. Never, ever in the Bible is a man told to edify himself. Never. He's supposed to edify the church. He goes on to say that prophecy edifies the church. And he says down here in verse 8, If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? If you, if you sound taps 
And when you're going into the battle and everybody lays down and goes to sleep, you're going to get whipped by the enemy, aren't you? Yes. Taps is for going to bed. And then he says, so likewise, ye accept ye utter by the word, by the tongue, words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken for? You shall speak into the air. You're just talking into the air. You're, only you understand what you're talking about if you're speaking in a glossa. If you go into the church at Corinth and you're speaking some language that the French, modern-day French, evolved from, all you're doing is talking to Franks, and that's all, and nobody else understands you. He says, don't do that. There are... There it may be so many kinds of voices. The word voice is phone, a p h o n e. It's our word phone. When we say answer the phone, we mean answer the voice. In the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, I know not the meaning of the voice. I shall be to him that speaketh a barbarian. Doesn't sound like he's talking about speaking in some language or nobody understands it. He that speaketh to me shall be a barbarian. And he says, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may, edit, may excel to the edifying of the church. Now, when you see that, look back what you just read up in verse, uh, he that speaketh in a tongue, in verse 2, he edifies himself. He doesn't edify God, he's edifying, building up himself. So it says that in verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. And he says down here in verse 12, edify the church, not yourself. That is a condemnation, not a commendation. He's condemning people who lift themselves up simply because they can speak other languages. Don't do that when you're preaching. Then he goes on to say, wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown. If you notice, unknown is it's in italics. That always means it's not in the text that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. He's not talking about I'm, spe I'm praying uh, in, a, in a tongue that's unknown to the person speaking. If I pray in a tongue, in a glossa, that nobody there but me knows the things that I understand are not bearing fruit in the church. That's what he's saying. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, with the truth, and I will pray with understanding also. People don't understand me when I pray. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else... When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen? If a man is not knowing what's going on, he says, I don't want this foolishness. In fact, God is condemning the Pentecostals right here, isn't he? At the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what he says. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with glossa more than you all because I am an educated man and I have the gifts of an apostle which was to be able to speak in a glossa that I had not learned so we could go to all the world. The apostles went into the world. All the gifts that the apostles had according to 2 Corinthians 12 and 12, the gifts of an apostle was to prove who they were to the world. The miracles were to prove who Jesus was. It wasn't for the sake of the person being healed. And it wasn't because they had faith that they were healed. I thank my God I spake with gloss of more than y'all. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, with what I can understand, than that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue, a gloss of that nobody understands. Brethren, be not children understanding, howbeit in malice or in hatred towards one another, be children, forgive easily, quickly. But understanding, be men. In the law it is written, with men of other glossa, 
Anytime it says in the law, it is written, you have to go back to the Old Testament to find out where it's written. So what God is doing, he is connecting Isaiah 28 with 1 Corinthians 14. What he says in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, is the same thing as the glossa in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. He says, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, Israel, and for all that they will not hear me. I spoke to Israel with foreign languages, but he's not talking about he had somebody come and talk to him. The foreign language he said I spoke to him with was when the Assyrians came into Israel and they started whipping them with their whips and they started saying this Assyrian language. The Assyrian language sounded like stuttering of the Hebrew language since the Assyrian language was a dialect of Hebrew. But because you understood Hebrew didn't mean you could understand the Assyrians. So God says, here's how I spoke to Israel. Because they went after these other gods, I had the Assyrians come in, and they're screaming, hi, with their horses, whipping with their whips, running over them. He says, that's how I talk to Israel. It's like, you didn't hear me, you'll hear this belt. That's what God is saying. He says, I'll talk to you with a switch. And that's what he uses the Assyrians for. He uses them as a switch. Now, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Now, glossa, that's the word tongue. Foreign languages are a sign to them that believe not. And the word sign, simeon, means a flag, signal, a beacon. You say, what do you mean by that, Jim? What if I said a pointer? Pointer. It, tongues are a pointer to them that believe not. Now, the Jews always got signs. We've already gone through that, how they got fire by night and a cloud by day and bread in the morning and uh, that was man in the morning and they got, the shoes didn't wear out and their, sweet never, their feet never swelled up in 40 years. That's signs and many other signs. And they got the 10 plagues in Egypt. Those are signs. They got Pharaoh's armies being conquered. Those are signs. They always got signs, and the Jews seek a sign, but the Greeks seek wisdom. That's in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. So the, they always seeking a sign, a pointer. As like I've said, if you see something that says good year, good year, right above this building, that means tires are sold down here, tires. And it's a pointer to that building. That's a sign, that's a simeon, that's a signal, that's a flag. So, he says, glossa, foreign languages, is a sign to them that believe not. And the only sign to the unbeliever, according to that 12th chapter of Matthew, is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus said, Pharisees, you come to me seeking a sign. From now on, you get no sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. That is that he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, and then resurrection. That's the sign to the unbeliever. He said that again in Matthew, the 16th chapter. The sign of the prophet Jonah. Resurrection is what has to be preached when the tongues are being preached. Isn't that what has to be preached? Glossa is a sign to them. It's a sign to them that believe not. And the only sign to them that believe not is the resurrection. So glossa Foreign languages has to equal resurrection. And I said at the beginning of the message that tongues or glossa was the method of getting the gospel to the Gentile world. That's because the resurrection is the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So, Glossa is getting the resurrection of the gospel to the Gentile 
world. And the Jews that are at Jerusalem, they're all going to leave and go back to their lands. And in their language, they're going to preach this glossa to all the world. And then God's kingdom is going to be from sea to sea. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, glory of the Lord as waters that cover the sea. And all over the world, the church will be. And now, if tongues are for a sign to them that believe not, and the only sign to the unbeliever is resurrection, then Peter has to be preaching. Peter must be preaching, preaching the resurrection in Acts 2, right? Acts 2. Isn't that true? Peter has to be preaching the resurrection with these heteroglossa. Heteroglossa, other foreign languages. Hetero is the Greek word other. He has to be preaching the resurrection. Let's go over there and see if that's what he's preaching. Okay? Go over here. Acts 2. The tongues was the absolute necessity since Alexander the Great, since Israel had been scattered and not hardly anybody was speaking Hebrew anymore and everyone in the world was speaking a dialect of the Koine Greek, it's, there was an absolute necessity for the tongues to be used to get the gospel or the resurrection, which is the only sign of the unbeliever, and tongues were for a sign. I'm going to keep saying that. Tongues were for a sign, and the only sign is resurrection. So tongues has to be preaching the resurrection anytime it's used. Now we preach down. They said, how here we every man in our own dialect wherein we were born in verse 8. These are Jews from every nation under heaven in verse 5. There were Parthian Jews, Mede Jews, Elamite Jews, dwellers in Mesopotamia Jews, Judean Jews, Cappadocian Jews, Pontus Jews, Asian Jews, Phrygian, Pamphylian, uh, Libyan Jews, Cyrene Jews, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Strangers were proselytes. And then he says Jews and proselytes, Christian Jews, Arabian Jews, and so forth. And we heard them speak in Glossa the wonderful works of God. Magnificence. God's magnificence is the resurrection. Why, why the resurrection? Jesus came with all these signs over here in the Old Testament. He was the I Am of the Old Testament. But when you get to the New, he says, since you never believed all these signs over here, I'm going to pour, perform the greatest sign that has ever come along. I'm going to have one of you kill me, and I'm going to stand up on my feet. Then if you don't believe that, you have no sign. That's the only sign. I'm going to stand up after you kill me. Only a living God can do that. Now, that's what he did it for. Now, let's keep reading. In verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, said, You men of Judea, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, hearken to my words. These are not drunken, as you said in verse 13. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but... Nine o'clock in the morning, third hour of the day. Six o'clock was the first hour, six to seven, seven to eight was the second hour, eight to nine was the third hour. And this is that. This that's going on here is that, which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It's going on right here, therefore, we're in the last days. And it shall come to pass in the last days, perhaps the last 2,000 years, the days of the Lord is 1,000 years, 1,000 years, one day. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh as opposed to the one flesh of the Jews. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. We've gone through that. Uh, God never gave the sons and the daughters the ability to prophesy. He'd pick out an old Jew or an old Arab or like Elijah or somebody. God just picked out his, but usually it was an older man, not young people. And he says, not only that, but your servants will be able to prophesy. How do they do that? Prophesy doesn't mean I got a word of prophecy for you. Prophesy, prophetase, a prophetase, a prophetia means to speak the word of God. That's what it means. 
Now we've got the Bible in every language of the world. We don't need the gloss and the dialects. We certainly don't need it here in America. We've got all these English Bibles and we all speak English. Now, he says, It shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will be prophesied. And your young men shall have insight. The word vision means insight. It doesn't mean, I've had a vision. It's not what it means. It means insight. You'll be able to perceive things. But God didn't move upon young men that way. And old men shall dream dreams. That means to have the understanding of a young man and be able to do a work for God. I, I told Mary I keep getting emails from Beaumont High School, Beaumont, Texas. All my classmates, all the class of 57 is dying. I don't have time to die. I got a ministry to do. I believe God's going to keep me here for a long time. So he's letting old men like me preach the truth and have dreams of being able to get this message out. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, which he never put it upon a slave, I will pour out of my, in those days of my spirit, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. And we said, we spoke of the sun going down on the prophets and that there'll be no prophecy. That's talking about spiritual darkness, how that there, the time will come when there'll be a famine. It won't be a famine of bread and water, but a famine of the word of God. That's what Amos the 8th chapter says. And the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come, the moon, something turned into blood meant to die. That's a very idiom, idiomatic term. If the moon dies, where does the moon get its light? Turn to blood meant to die. It gets its light from the sun. If the moon dies, then at night it's pitch dark. This is idiomatic language talking about there's going to be a pitch darkness concerning truth at the end of time. We're nearly in that pitch darkness right now, aren't we? I don't hear any truth coming from anywhere. I don't hear any preachers talking about daily cross, death to self, self-denial. I sat here and talked with the engineer that worked with Mike last night. And I said, Jesus said that if you do not bear your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. I said, you can't go to heaven without a daily cross. And I said, most people don't even know what that is. And I said, they don't even know where to get one, much less what it is. And he just went, wow, man, they're not saying that, are they? I said, no. And I said, you can't go to heaven without a daily cross. Nobody here can go to heaven without a daily cross. You're not following Jesus without a daily cross. What is it? Where do you get it? By, by the same place Jesus got his, by telling truth. If it's written in your heart, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and you can't keep from saying something to your neighbor, to a friend at the grocery store about Jesus or God or Christmas or predestination or God doesn't love everybody, you can't keep from saying it. And then he says, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever is talking about the Gentiles. God didn't extend this to everybody, and I'll go into whosoever in a minute. But I want to get to what Peter is talking about. All through here, as Peter lifts up his voice and said, the word said is apophothengamai. It's the same word as utterance back in verse 4. Apophothengamai. It means to speak clearly. So you can be easily understood. What language is P Peter talking in? And he's got all of these people listening. He's speaking with heteroglossa, isn't he? I don't know what, what's coming out of his mouth, but I know it's going into the ears of those people that are listening. They're hearing in their own dialect when they were born. We aren't there, and we can't understand this dialectos and glossa. Now, Peter must be preaching the resurrection. Right? Let's continue reading. Ye men of Israel. Ye men of Israel, from every nation under heaven, they all speak a hundred different dialects and glossa. They're hearing. 
That's the miracle of it all. And as the church matured, then those things in part were done away with. I spoke on that about two weeks ago. The tongues have ceased. That was a miracle for the day and the time for these apostles from northern Galilee to be able to take the gospel to all the world. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. It means exhibited, apodignomy, A-P-O-D-E-I-K, A-P-O-D-E-I-K-N-U-M-I. Exhibited apart. God has, been, has set Christ apart, and this is talking about what the miracles were for. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, dunamis. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The gospel is the dunamis. That's what the scripture says. In Romans 1, 16. Then he goes on to say, And wonders, teros, omens, special signs. Jesus has been an omen a special sign to all the world. And he says, and signs, Simeon. And what is the only sign now? Resurrection, which will be spoken by Glossa. Tongues are for a sign. And, and the only sign then, believer, is the sign of Jonah, Resurrection there in Matthew 12. Then he says, so we've got Peter somewhere who's got to start talking about the resurrection, doesn't he? And he's talking in heteroglossa. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel, the horizo, boule, purpose, Horizo, prohorizo, and that is, that's past tense because it has to be the same. Every word has to be in context with every word, other word in the Bible. Remember over there in Acts 4 and 28, where Peter and John in the previous verses had been threatened to be beaten if they speak in this name anymore because Jesus is resurrected. And the Pharisees threatened to beat, beat Peter and and John for speaking in this name, and they say there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and they go back to the other apostles, and they begin to pray to God in this name of Jesus, and they say, the day that Jesus died, thy holy child Jesus, that Herod was there, Pilate was there, and they were putting this man to death who was innocent, and that's murder, and the the Gentiles were there. The soldiers were there piercing his side saying, and they were beating him and saying, who is it that beat you, prophet? And the Jews were there screaming, crucify him. And they were there for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel, God, determined before to be done. Determined before is the word prohorizo. God, pro is the word predestinate. God predestinated the murder of Jesus by the hands of evil men. God ordained their minds. And Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay my life down. I could call ten legions of angels, but I'm paying for my wife, the church. I only have one particular people I'm dying for, my church, my wife. He didn't die for everybody. The man in hell is dying for his own sin. Now, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge, prognosis, P-R-O-G-N-O-S-I-S. It's, of course, it is a derivative of the word prognosco. That word is foreknow. For whom he did foreknow. Whom? 
Who's? He did foreknow. Know intimately ahead of time. The ones that God foreknew are the ones that he's predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Predestination is not about, well, God chose you to go to heaven no matter what you do, and you'll get to heaven anyway. That's not predestination. Predestination is about God choosing a family, birthing them by his will. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God's will. Of his own will begat he us. Jesus quickens whom he will in John 5, 21. Quicken, zoom, pa'el, means to make alive. He makes alive only his people that he chose. And the people that he foreknew, prognosco, those are the ones he's predestined, prohorizo, to be conformed. We're not just predestined to go to heaven. We're predestined for the light, the horizo, the horizon, and that has to do with forgiveness. Forgiveness is the word aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S. It means to pardon and release from prison. Remember, prison, fulake, is the word, the division between light and dark, and God is predetermined. And aphesis means to pardon and release from prison or to pardon and release from darkness to light. God has preordained the forgiveness of his people and forgiveness comes by repentance, so he, it is only the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And if a man repents, God's got to cause him because there's none good and none seeks after God. Nobody will seek after God. If God doesn't chase a people down and make them turn and look at him, nobody's coming. And that's the truth. Well, that's not fair that God would send some men to hell on purpose. It's fair that he sends Everybody to hell on purpose. It's grace that he doesn't send some of us. Grace, charis, means unmerited favor. We did nothing to merit that. Well, I won't know why God did this. He does it according to the good pleasure of his will, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We've been adopted when children are adopted, they don't do the adopting. You go over here to a, an orphanage. A person goes to an orphanage, and you go in there to look for a child. The child don't pick you. You pick them. That word adoption is the word huiothosia, H-U-I-O. T-H-E-S-I. This is in Ephesians 4 and 5 having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Adoption, huothosia, is a construction of huios, which is the word sons, and tithome, which means to place. God places sons in his kingdom according to the good pleasure of his will. And then he don't leave you alone. He beats you to conform you to the likeness of Jesus, to the icon, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed, sumorphos, to be shaped in fellowship. That's why fellowship is so important. We have to blend together. This is what shapes us. When we come together in fellowship, we come together to be made like Jesus. God will whip us, those that he's predestined, he's going to beat us and spank us until we learn to behave ourselves. Well, what about the kids down the street? One fellow said, called me on the phone, he said, well, if you had ten children, would you want nine of them to go to hell? I said, you don't understand. Vessels of wrath fitted to destruction are not God's children. They're the children of the devil. That's what Jesus said to them in John 8. He said, your father's the devil. The works of your father you will do. I don't go outside. I, when Eric was at home, I didn't go out and tell the neighbor's kids, come in, it's time to go to bed. Have you ever done that? They're going to think, Mama, there's a crazy guy next door. He's wanting me to come go to bed in his house. Told me to come eat supper. We don't do that with the devil's children. I don't do that with the other people's children. We are the children of God, and everybody is not. 
God does not love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and gave himself for her. You think he didn't know his church before the foundation of the world when our names are written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If he died before the foundation of the world, he knew who his family was, didn't he? We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit and believing the truth. He's going to take the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and set you apart through years and years of trial and fire and beat you into submission if you belong to Him. If you don't belong to Him, you're a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, God willing to show His wrath and make His power known. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted, catartizo, fully accomplished to be destroyed. God don't love everybody. This is amazing. People think God is up there just wringing his hands, going, I just wish I could get everybody to accept me as their Savior. <laughs> and I'm going to cry forever in heaven because I love you. You're in hell. He don't love the men in hell. He hates all workers of iniquity. He said when Rebecca had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, Jacob and Esau in her womb, twins, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger, Esau will serve Jacob, and he did that in his later on in his life, and in his nation, uh, the Edomites served Jacob, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But people hate that doctrine even though it's Bible. Preachers hate it. Billy Graham don't like it. Charles Stanley hates it. Adrian Rogers said he hated that doctrine. I have heard Jerry Falwell said he hated predestination. What is wrong with you people? That is Bible. Well, I just don't understand how God could send people to hell on purpose. Did God ask you to understand him or believe him? Which? I have found that I don't try to figure God out. I read his word and says, he said he preordained his family. He said these are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. But people say, well, that'd be unrighteous. Even Paul says it's the unrighteousness with God. God forbid, for he said to Moses, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will and don't nobody talk back to me. I'm God. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. He saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. And the Bible goes on to say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He hardens who he wills. And God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will not let the people go. And the Lord said, you go tell Pharaoh, let my son go. For Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And if you will not let my son go, I will kill your son, even your firstborn, Pharaoh. Oh, Moses, by the way, I'm going to harden his heart. And he will not let the people go. You tell me what kind of chance Pharaoh's son had. No chance at all. And then he goes on to say in that night, chapter of Romans, you, you will say, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? And then he says, Yea, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? The Bible says over there in Job 33, 13, Why are you striving against your maker? He giveth not account of any of his matters. And he's ordained everything to be. Why are you worrying? Why are you stressing? Take no thought for your life. He's got everything ordained, doesn't he? He's ordained everything. You say, that just doesn't seem fair. Well, let me ask you another question. He goes on to the next verse. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump in Rebekah's womb to make one vessel unto honor Jacob and another to dishonor if that's what he wants to do? Does God have that ability to do that? Are you going to sit there and say, I just don't think that's right, God. I'll tell you what you do. When you get to heaven, if you get there, 
grab by God by the collar and say, I don't like that. Why don't you do that? Hey, you don't like that? Too bad. Predestination is true. The Bible says so. Good grief. What do, I, what do you need? Well, it's only in the Bible six times. Well, John 3.16 is only there one time. John 3.16 is a predestination verse. It doesn't say God loved everybody in the world. It doesn't say that. Not in the original text. It says, for God so loved. So, so, so. So is an adverb. Adverbs tell how, when, where, and sometimes why. And so tells how or in what fashion God loved. An adverb modifies verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. It modifies the verb loved. To modify something means to change it and put a condition on it. It conditions God's love. For God in the same fashion loved. In what fashion? From verse 14, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. In this same fashion, those that looked lived. Well, who's going to look to God? The hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord hath made even both of them. If God gives the seeing eye, only people who will look at Christ and live. But you don't do that by your own free will because there's none that seeks after God. So, John 3.16 is about John 3.14. That's what it's about. As Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. For God in the same fashion loved agape. We're getting into the whosoever's. I'll get to there in a minute, okay? Or next week. I'm going to give you all the different words for whosoever, and not one of them means whosoever will may come. I hate that song. Now, where were we? Gosh, that took me off on a long tangent, didn't it? <laughs> so Peter's got to be talking about the resurrection, doesn't he? I'm going to get into whosoever. Whosoever, whosoever will sounds like free will. The word is not in the original text. I'm going to have to go back through 2 Peter 3 in this thing on tongues because tongues is the method of getting the message to the whosoever's or to the all men. God will have all men be saved. All men will be saved, but not every individual. Pos, anthropos is the word all men. What it means, men from every nation, tongue and tribe, red, yellow, white, black, and brown men. Remember the Jews had a word, S Y N E C. D-O-C-H-E. Synecdoche meant a part of something was the whole. If one red man is saved, one yellow man is saved, one white man is saved, one black man is saved, one brown man is saved, they said the whole race was saved. Well, let me ask you this. When Noah went up into the ark, was all humanity saved in these eight people? Yes, all men were saved. And out of Japheth comes the white race. Out of Ham comes the Negroid race. Out of Shem comes the Semitic race, and that's all men. That's what it's talking about. So God will have all men or the Gentiles be saved, and he said that to Timothy when he was pastoring the church at Ephesus, which is a Gentile church. God will have Ephesians saved, whereas in the Old Testament, Ephesians, there was no opportunity whatsoever. They weren't elect in the Old Testament. Let's continue to read here. Speaking of Jesus, delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, prognosis, we get our word prognosis from that. It means to know beforehand. Gnosis is our word science. That word science or knowledge. Knowledge or science is not something in general. It's something that's exact. God knew exactly what was going on because he planned it. He works all things after the counts of his own will, doesn't he? In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You mean when I have a car wreck? Yes. You mean whenever I get a ticket? Yes. 
You mean when I get all upset, been out of shape over what somebody does to me? Yes, and God is going to let you do that till he teaches you not to do that. You see, he's going to pull all of us out of our sin because he's predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And it takes a good beating to get rid of that outer man, doesn't it? We got an inner man and an outer man, and the outer man can't do right, and the inner man can't do wrong, and the inner man is Christ, and the outer man is self. And Paul speaks of those two men in Romans 7. He said, the outer man serves the law of the flesh, and the inner man serves the law of God, law of God, and that's Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the outer man is self, and it's going to take years to get rid of the contention and strife and pride and and jealousy and all the rest of this, and God will put you through fires until he burns out most of that by the time you get to be an old person. And you have to go through fire, and that is conforming us to his likeness. Predestination is about conforming us to responsibility and accountability before God. And he chose us to be that way. He didn't just choose us to be in heaven. It's kind of like I've said, well, I'm going to California and I'm in Nashville. Well, how are you getting to California? Oh, I'm just going to be there one day. No matter what I do in between, I'm just getting to California no matter what I do. You're either going to go by boat or you're going to go by car or train or you're going to walk or go by bicycle or you're going to fly or some way. You're not just going to be there. God doesn't preordain us to be there. He preordains the pathway there, which is the narrow way. Narrow is the word thalibo, it's tribulation. We have to be in the tribulation way. That's what he's preordained for us. Hasn't he? I don't even understand how people think that they can make their way to heaven. Now, let's continue reading. Delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Remember Peter's preaching in Glossa, heteroglossa, whom God hath raised up. Is that resurrection? Is he preaching the resurrection right here when he's using Glossa? He's using foreign language to preach resurrection to these Jews from every nation under heaven. And they're going to take this back to the Gentile world and preach it. And there's going to be 3,000 that day that believe of these Jews, and they're going to take it back to their Gentile nations wherein they were born. And he's preaching the resurrection, isn't he? Now let's, But he didn't just say it. Here he goes on to have, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible, it was impossible that Jesus should be held down. Kill me and watch me stand up on my feet. I'm God. You can't kill me and keep me down. For David speaketh concerning Jesus. Now notice this. This doesn't say what people say. Jesus didn't go to hell. It's the stupidest thing. David speaks, not he's speaking today, he does in the sense of the Psalms, but David speaks, that's past tense. David speaks concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, this is David's words, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. I'll be established in his word and I can't be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. This is David's words. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. This is David talking, not Jesus. That's being quoted from Psalms, the 16th chapter. Let's go over there. Psalms. How much time do I have? I ain't going to get through this at all. I'm taking my time going through this. I want you to really understand the terms. Psalms 16th chapter. 
Now these are David's words. Psalm 16. Now, well, keep thumbing past it. 16. He uses the same words in verse 9. This is David in distrust of merit flees to God for preservation at the top. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also rests in hope. Thou wilt not leave my soul or David's soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, which is Jesus, to see corruption in the grave. David is saying, I'm going to be resurrected one day. You mean David went to hell? Not hell that you think of. Let me put this on the board again. The word hell in the translation of the Bible, in King James' translation, was translated in 1611. There was a committee of 47 people translating it. And in this translation, the word hell was an Irish term. Hell was a long, deep trench where they would bury their potatoes, the Irish, so the potatoes wouldn't rot. That's what hell is. But this word hell here is the word Hades. Remember, there are no H's in the Greek. There is a, there's a diacritical mark that has the breathing sound, which has an H sound. Hades. That's the word, that's the New Testament word that's commonly used for hell. You have the word Gehenna. We're not going to get into that right now. But over in, David said in, uh, in Psalm 16, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Neither. Neither. David won't be left in the grave. Hades, let me explain the Jewish meaning of Hades. They had a good compartment of Hades and a bad compartment of Hades. Bad Hades. Now, Hades is the construction of the word Ido. Ido means to see or perceive. Remember, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. He used the word Ido. I see who I believe in. I'm watching myself die. When you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word is a negative particle. It negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. Placing the alpha in front of Ido translates Hades. It means the place of the unseen, not to see, not to perceive. The Jew said in the good compartment, you had, you had a tomb where you couldn't see. There's a word to lie hid, to lie hid, to lie hid. That word lie hid is the word crypto. Crypto means to lie hid. It's our word crypt. A crypt is a tomb, and that's where you cannot see the body. So the tomb or the grave was called Hades. And all good people that died believing God, their body goes into a tomb or a Hades. And the word grave is translated Hades. What David is saying, you will not leave my soul in the grave. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15 very quickly and hold your place there. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twink of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corrupt, and we shall be changed in verse 52. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
So when this corruptible hath put on incorruption, and this mortal hath put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, O Hades, where is thy victory? The grave was also called Hades or hell. David, it says, God's not going to leave me in the grave. Grave. He's not going to leave me in the grave. Neither will he suffer or allow, allow Jesus' body to see corruption. His body will not be corrupt. He will resurrect the third day. Before rigor mortis sets in and his body stiffens, God says, I'll raise him. So you had a, then you had a bad compartment for the spirit. You had a, a good compartment of the spirit of Hades, and that was in heaven, in heaven, or wherever the heaven is with Jesus. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Wherever that heaven is, that is where the spirit of the rich of the poor man or Lazarus went. Lazarus went in Luke 16. Lazarus died and was carried to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and in Hades, well, he had a crypt or a tomb and his body was in that tomb. And he was in the bad compartment of Hades, the place of torture. That's where his... He said, I'm tormented in this flame. Now, I don't know what kind of a flame it was when he said, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Where was his literal tongue? It was over here in the tomb. You think his literal tongue was what he was talking about? No. Some kind of a spiritual place where he was, and what kind of water did he want on that evil, wicked, spiritual tongue. I don't know. Certainly not the truth. There's no truth in hell. There's no Holy Spirit in hell, is there? No. So they had a place for the body, a place for the spirit in these two compartments. So it means the place of the unseen. That's why when you read Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, ninth chapter, and you see a verse there that says, the dead know nothing at all that's going on upon the earth. The Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, see, when you're dead, you're dead like a dog and you don't know anything. No, no, it doesn't say you don't. You mean that rich man that died and in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. He didn't know what was going on, saying, Father Abraham sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. You mean he didn't know what was going on. He knew he was hot. He knew he wanted some kind of water. And he was in some kind of fire and he was in torment. So what David is saying, he's saying in verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave, you're going to resurrect me too. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Neither is a very important word. The word means not either to. None of the two, not one or the other. He says, God's not going to leave my soul in the grave, and he's not going to suffer Jesus to see corruption. He's going to raise him from the dead. And this is Peter preaching in heteroglossa, isn't it? Preaching the resurrection in this tongue. Isn't he? Can you see that? Is that that hard to see? It's not. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. This is David's words. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, this is back to Peter speaking. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. You see, when you get to verse 29, that's Peter speaking. When you start in, up here in verse 25, that's David speaking. Then he says, verse 29, this is back to Peter. Peter is quoting David in those other verses, but this is Peter speaking here. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, but he's not going to stay in his grave. He's talking the resurrection, isn't he? 
Isn't this the only sign? Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not. And the unbelieving were the Gentiles. So God has brought unbelieving Gentiles who are elect of his to Jerusalem to cause them to believe and take the message back to all the world and all these dialects and glosses. The tongues thing is very important, isn't it? It's not just saying there are four languages. There's more to it than that. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the pat patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and he, in his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to David that of the fruit of his loins, out of David's loins, According to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to speak on his throne. Jesus is the son of David. And you're going to find this in the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 7 and 12. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Jim, I thought you said resurrection every time you found it was feminine gender. It is. Anastasis. And the is the word hey. The, that's always feminine when you find the Ada. That's feminine. The res feminine resurrection. Whose resurrection is he talking about here? Feminine resurrection. He's talking about David's resurrection. David said, he will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will Christ. He's going to raise us both up. He raised up Christ, and he's going to raise me up one day. The resurrection is feminine. The church is the wife, the bride of Christ. And David is in the church, isn't he? David is one of the called out of God. And people who say the church is not in the Old Testament, what are you going to do with this? And he speaks, he sing. where was that? Therefore being a prophet, no, no, he sing this before spake. Before spake is arising indicative. It's talking about David speaking this in the Old Testament. David spake of the resurrection of Christ in him. Not just Jesus' resurrection. This cannot be possibly talking about Jesus' resurrection from the grave. David is talking about, he just got through saying, he will not leave my soul in the grave. He's going to resurrect in me. Isn't that what he's saying? This cannot be Jesus' resurrection from the grave. It's feminine gender. Every time you find the word resurrection, it's always feminine gender, except for one place. Well, it's feminine also, but it's always anastasis. And he's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Jesus, that his soul, David's soul, was not left in hell. And many of the Pentecostals say, see, Jesus went to hell. You got to see who's talking. Peter is talking, quoting David, isn't he? He quotes David up here in verse 25 down through 27. And he's quoting David down here. He says that his soul was not left in hell. David said, you won't leave my soul in the grave. Jesus didn't go to hell. It's ridiculous. He told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Didn't he? These people say Jesus went down to hell and conquered the devil. That's foolishness. That David's soul was not left in hell, neither did David's soul see corruption. He says, Jesus won't see corruption. I won't see corruption. He'll raise me from the dead. This Jesus hath God raised up. What's Peter preaching here? Resurrection. Resurrection. In what? Heteroglossa, isn't he? And you can't explain this to a Pentecostal when they say, well, I know what I feel. I know my experience. You're ignorant too. If you don't change your ways, you just might not belong to God. God just may not love you. Has it ever occurred to you? 
If he loves you, he's going to scourge you and cause you to be willing to be righteous and live like Christ and believe his word. You can't believe Christ without believing the words that he wrote. He inspired this book. You have to believe it. You have to believe predestination is in the Bible. Uh, the best thing to say to somebody says, I don't believe in predestination. I had a fellow down at Sam's one time. Ran into him. He's a Baptist. Went out here to two rivers. And I said, well, the reason I believe such and such is I believe in predestination. He just got through telling me, going to two rivers, and I go to two rivers, and I'm this and that. He said, well, I don't believe in predestination. I said, you have to believe in it. It's in the Bible. He went, I don't think he ever even knew that it was in the Bible. Now, forget prohorizo, that's the meaning of it, to pre-bound inside the light. He didn't even believe in that it was written in there, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He's predestinated us according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. What do people do with this? What do you do with it? So I don't believe that. Throw, throw it out. You can't throw it out. It's got an exact meaning. Now, Peter is preaching in the glossa, in the heteroglossa, the resurrection, which is the only sign to the unbeliever, and that is the sign of the prophet Jonah, and tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, to them that believe not, and that only sign is the resurrection. That's what the tongues were for. That seems fairly simple, doesn't it? All these Jews coming back to Jerusalem for these feast days, but they still have a home over here. These Jews were scattered by, remember, Nebuchadnezzar and by the Assyrians, and they live all over the world. This guy in lives up here somewhere close to Corinth, maybe don't live inside the city, lives on a farm outside of Corinth, but he knows he has to go every year, and he goes back and he preaches to all his neighbors the resurrection of Jesus, and some of them are elect. That's what this is for. It's not like just, well, that's foreign languages. There's a, there's a big story to it. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Who's he talking about? There's 11 guys here plus Matthias who's been added to him at the end of that first chapter to take Judah's place. He said, all of us are witnesses. Evidently, Matthias was there and saw Jesus too because this is 50 days after the Passover where they killed him. So it's in all likelihood that Matthias was there. He was a righteous man. So he was probably standing around the cross watching Jesus be crucified, and he didn't know he's going to be one of the apostles to take this message to all the world by the dialects and the gloss. Am I out of time? Can you see this? It's, and the only reason I ask you if you can see it, I know you're not dumb. This is a lot of stuff in one message. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth and for your word. God help us in all that we do to continue to preach this. I, Lord, you just give me the words and I'll say it. Lord, I'll say it. Give us the method and the avenue. Open up many doors for the ministry, the TV and the Internet. I'll keep saying this either till you come and take me out of here till somebody kills me, Lord. I don't, whichever one is fine with me. Lord, I pray for the flock. Strengthen the flock. Help the sheep be strong. And we give you praise for everything. Lead us to your elect. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. I'm about to finish up with this, I hope.